All right, well, we're going to start. Let's open in prayer first. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that um, you are always the one who sets the agenda, um, that you are the one who has the plans and the purposes for our time, for the season that we're in. You know what we need. You know how to meet the deep needs of our soul. And I thank you that we can trust that your plans are always good. And so, Heavenly Father, we just want to offer ourselves and this time, all of our attention and energy to you. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us, that you would give us direction and wisdom, um, and that you would bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I'm going to leave the doors open because it is warm. <laughs> I think that's going to help the most. But if it gets too loud, we may close them. Um, so today our workshop is on hushing your face and just being with God, or the practice of silence. Um, this practice is seen all the way through scripture. Uh, you'll find it most clearly in Psalms. So whenever it says Selah, that was always a pause for uh, silent meditation. Or when the Gospels describe the disciples and the crowds, notably Mary, listening to Jesus teach. Ultimately, the practice of silence is about learning to be with God, to receive from him, to disconnect ourselves from working and earning and being in control, and to learn to surrender to and delight in God. But before we get to the actual practice, we need to first discuss why it is so essential to us as disciples of Jesus. Most of this is coming from um, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. He's written a whole series of books um, on emotionally healthy discipleship and has, or discipleship is the main one. Um, and then he has a really good study, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Both of them I highly recommend. Um, the whole book is on moving from unhealthy discipleship that has characterized the Western church for the last few generations um, into healthy spirituality that returns to biblical truth and the way of Jesus. So in his book, he writes, in our efforts to serve God, most of us actually end up skimping on our relationship with him. We're in a perpetual state of hurry, battling to make the best use of every spare minute. We end our days exhausted from trying to meet the endless needs around us. Then our free time is filled with more demands in an already overburdened life. Some of us are actually addicted, not to drugs or alcohol, but to the adrenaline rush of doing. We might read about the need to rest and recharge, but we fear how many things might fall apart if we did. So we just keep going. And in this hurried and exhausted state, we have little time or energy left to invest in our relationship with God, ourselves, or others. And as a result, our own lives remain largely unchanged, and the only thing we have to give away to those we lead is our shallow discipleship. And he goes on to explain that one of the best examples of this in scripture is the iconic account of Mary and Martha in Luke 10. So in this passage, Mary is seated at Jesus' feet, and this is notable not only because she's listening to what Jesus is saying, um, but because that was the position of a disciple under a rabbi, and this was not a position that was ever given to women. Um, it was solely for men, because women were supposed to be essentially in the kitchen. They were supposed to be handling the household, right? Um, but the fact that Mary is seated at Jesus' feet is wildly unusual. That alone is countercultural. Then Martha, who is distracted and busy with all the preparations for hosting Jesus and his disciples, she has this very understandable cultural reaction because Mary is not where she's supposed to be. But she also has this personal reaction out of her own stress and overwhelm. She asked Jesus, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So Martha, um, Pete Scazzaro writes, Martha is actively serving Jesus, 
but she is missing him. Her life in this moment is defined by duty, by shoulds and have tos, pressures and distractions, but her commitment to her duties has disconnected her from her love for Jesus. In fact, Martha's problem goes well beyond her momentary busyness. Her life itself is uncentered and fragmented. I suspect that even if Martha had taken the time to sit at Jesus' feet, she would still have been distracted. She is touchy, irritable, and anxious. And we can see that anxiety in the question that she asks. Um, She says, Lord, don't you care that, and then continues on, Lord, don't you care that I'm the only one holding this particular ministry together? Or Lord, don't you care that I'm the only one keeping this household running? Or don't you care that I'm the only one putting any effort into maintaining relationships? Or handling all these things that have to be done at work? So one of the surest signs that her life is out of order is the fact that she even tells Jesus what to do. Tell her to help me. Because she believes, based on that statement, she believes that the best way to solve her anxiety is for someone else to come and help her do the work. Now Mary, on the other hand, is active in a different way. She sits at the feet of Jesus, listening to him. She is focused on being with Jesus, enjoying communion with him, loving him. She is attentive, open, taking pleasure in his presence. She is engaged in a slowed down spirituality that prioritizes being with Jesus over doing for Jesus. Mary has one center of gravity, Jesus. Scazzaro writes, I suspect that if Mary had gotten up to help with the many household chores, she would not have been worried or upset by the same preparations that distracted her sister. Why? Because she slowed down enough to focus on Jesus and to center her life on him. That was her better choice. So what we need is a better balance because if all of our doing becomes a master, then it becomes the governing inner voice. It shapes these instincts that are actually born out of a kind of anxiety. And now we aren't serving out of an overflow of love of Christ because we daily and often spend time in his presence being filled up by him. Instead, we're running on fumes. We're trying to tackle the ever-growing to-do list of the needs around us, relying on our own ability and our own energy, and constantly telling ourselves things like, next week things will calm down, or things won't be so busy once they hire someone else, or once the kids are grown, or once school is done, or once I retire, or once I have the energy, and then I will have the luxury of lingering in the presence of God. There is always something external to us that we credit for not allowing us to have the time or the energy to spend that time with God. The problem with that approach is we are externalizing the solution to what is an internal problem. And we're putting external forces then in charge of our inner life with God. And that's, it's not biblical. That doesn't line up with reality. The solution isn't our circumstances changing. It can't be the culture changing um, to support a healthy spirituality in me. Um, It can't even be the people and work and ministry around me taking responsibility for giving me the time and energy to be with God. This world is broken and it's never gonna support that. And other people aren't actually responsible for me in that way. So if that's what I'm looking for, my approach is flawed from the beginning. I am called to discipleship to Jesus that is countercultural, that says no to the impulses and rhythms of a world that does not know him. And I have been given the responsibility to steward my own life. And this means I get to make decisions and take steps to cultivate a rhythm of life that is oriented to Jesus so that he alone is Lord over me, so that I am dependent on him, and so that I am continually filled up by his love. And as I mature and gain experience being in his presence, I also learn to spend time in his presence regularly and often because I simply delight in being with him. That's something we're gonna cover in another workshop later on. 
So Skizero continues. He says, I had been taught early on about the importance of quiet time or devotions to nurture my personal relationship with Christ, but it simply was not enough to overcome another message I had been taught, that I must be actively serving Jesus with my gifts and doing a lot for him. The message to serve trumped the message to slow down for time with God. When we disciple or lead others, we essentially give away who we are, specifically who we are in God. We give who we are on the inside, we give our presence, we give our journey with Jesus. And this means we can give away only what we possess, which is the life we actually live each day. So what then is it that we have to give away? The answer for many of us is not much. Work for God that is not nourished by a deep interior life with God will eventually deteriorate, and us with it. The other thing that happens, Skizero writes, is that over time, our sense of worth and validation gradually shifts from a grounding in God's love to the success or failure of our ministry work and performance. It can also be shaped around... um, our, I don't want to call it secular work, but um, work apart from ministry, our paid work, that's a better term. Um, It can also be shaped around our family or around our relationships, our achievements. When that happens, when our worth and validation is grounded in those things, that's when the peace and the clarity and the spaciousness of our life with Christ slowly, almost imperceptibly disappears. Now, fortunately, as always, Jesus has a better way. Scazzaro writes in his book that an emotionally healthy disciple slows down to be with Jesus, goes beneath the surface of their life to be deeply transformed by Jesus, and offers their life as a gift to the world for Jesus. And it needs to happen in that order. An emotionally healthy disciple refers to a person who rejects busyness and hurry in order to reorient their entire life around their personal relationship with Jesus, developing rhythms, setting limits, and following him wherever he leads. At the same time, they intentionally open the depths of their interior life, their history, their disorientations, their areas of brokenness, and their relationships to be changed by Jesus. And they are deeply aware how everything they have and all they are is a gift. So they carry a profound awareness of stewarding their talents as a gift to bless the world for Jesus. Now, doesn't that sound so much better than the alternative? Now, the question is, how do we get there? What we need is a rhythm of life that enables us to operate from a place of emotional and spiritual fullness that produces deep awareness of ourselves and others and God. Our being with God has to sustain our doing for God. Now, the story of Mary and Martha demonstrates this vitally important truth. Scazzaro writes that the active life in the world for God can only properly flow from a deep inner life with God. When we integrate our doing for and our being with, our lives have a beauty, a harmony, and a clarity that makes the spiritual life both full and joyful. When we have sufficiently slowed down to be with God, our activity for God is marked by a deep, loving communion with God. And that's when Christ's life, more often than not, is able to flow through us to others. Which means it is naturally reflected in the way we make disciples and build healthy communities. Now that all sounds wonderful, but it also sounds like a lot. (laughs) Um, It is, because what Scazzaro is talking about is a whole reorientation of our lives and developing an entire rhythm, a rule of life that will support this. That's not something we're going to do in one session. And I don't even plan to go through everything he discusses today. We're just going to talk about kind of the first step in that process that can help support us and help get us reoriented to God in healthy ways, which is this practice of silence before God. So before we do that, we're going to pause and do a little self-assessment from Scazzaro. 
Um, this is a checklist that he uses to know when his doing for God is exceeding his being with God. Um, when I read this back in January, I loved the whole book. It was absolutely life-changing. Um, I've been working on some of these things. And then here I am six months later, <laughs> I've fallen back into old rhythms. And so I'm still checking these same boxes. So this is something we need to check in with on a regular basis. And that's how Schizero uses it in his own life. Um, rhythmically, he needs to check in and see what adjustments he needs season to season. Now the upside is, the more of these boxes we check, the more we're going to benefit from the practice of silence. Um, so as I read these, I'll have you just kind of keep a mental tally of how many you say yes to. So he writes, I know my doing exceeds my being when. I can't shake the pressure I feel from having too much to do in too little time. I am ignoring the stress, anxiety, and tightness of my body. I am concerned with what others think. I am often fearful about the future. I am always rushing. I am defensive and easily offended. I am preoccupied and distracted. I fire off quick opinions and judgments. I feel unenthusiastic about or threatened by the success of others and I spend more time talking than listening. Now, I have a few more to add on. These are arguably just signs of burnout, <laughs> but um, sometimes it's not so much that our doing is exceeding our being with God, as there's unattended to things that are um, also going to be solved by um, having that time of silence with God. So, a few that I would add to the list are, I am disappointed or hurt by the results and reactions of something I've invested in, whether that's a project or a relationship, that seem a little bit out of proportion to the situation. So that can be a sign that we're trying to meet a need um, through people or through work, that it just can't, it can't handle that need. It's not meant to do that. Um, I interpret all observations, complaints, and comments as requests or expectations to do more. That is a sign of chronic overfunctioning. I am disconnected from joy, or perhaps I'm not even sure what joy is. I am unfamiliar with delighting in God's presence, or spending time just being in God's presence feels more like a luxury than a birthright and necessity as a new creation in Christ. I have stopped praying before and as I do things, or there are simply a lot of things I never think to pray about. And that's a sign that we're moving into self-reliance. I feel like the effort and sacrifice I'm putting into relationships or into work is pointless. Why do I even bother? and I feel tired in ways that sleep isn't fixing. So, out of those, are there any that catch your attention? Mm -hmm. Anxiety is extremely common for us, um, especially in our, in our current culture. Hi. Um, which in a sense is good uh, because it means this practice is going to be very helpful. I just want to explore a bit, I guess, the science that mine's on. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get started on this journey of being with God before doing for God, getting reoriented to Christ in life-giving ways. Um, but first, I want to make sure that we all have a heads up about one of the main difficulties that we're going to encounter in this process. This isn't a bad thing. It just will take us by surprise if we don't have a heads up. 
um, and can be really discouraging if we're not prepped for it. Um, we would expect that it would be a matter of finding time that would be the main difficulty. Um, but actually, this practice of silence, especially to start, takes like between two and 10 minutes for your first like, few weeks, few months. Um, and that's like as long as it takes to get through a Starbucks drive through Like we can handle that on a daily basis. We might think that the main issue is gonna be handling our focus or quieting ourselves, quieting our inner voice. But we actually have tons of strategies and supports for that. And with practice, that also gets easier. That doesn't need to be that much of a worry after a few weeks of practice. The hardest thing is that when we start being still and silent, all of these undealt with emotions and issues are gonna start coming to the surface. And some, because we actively suppress them or tried to avoid them, some because we just weren't aware, but now that we're spending this time regularly with God, the Holy Spirit is bringing to our attention things that he wants to heal us and free us from. God will start speaking to us through our emotions, through memories, through anxieties um, that we may be entirely surprised are in us, through bringing scripture to mind, and so forth. Now, in this practice of silence, there is going to be absolutely sweet and precious, unmatched communion with God, where we will encounter the love of Jesus and the love of the Father in ways that will fill those deepest needs of our soul. Um, in places that we didn't even know existed. Um, it is going to bring such a profound sense of being cared for and healed. We will not know how we ever survived without it. And there's many of us who are not aware yet until we go through a practice like this that we have been living in this kind of survival mode and getting by on almost nothing. Um, John Mark Comer, in his book, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he talks about how when he started slowing down um, and practicing various habits of Jesus like um, Sabbath and silence and solitude, um, the emotional numbness that he was feeling started to go away. Um, but the happy, joyful, peaceful feelings were not the first ones that he felt. That actually came a lot further down the road than he expected. First, it was things like grief and anger and a lot of resentment that he had to work through. He had a lot of burnout he had to recover from. Um, and anxiety. He was constantly surprised by how much anxiety kept coming up. All of that has to be cleared away. Now we see this in scripture, especially in the Psalms. If you look at the ones that are written by David in particular, where he pours his heart out to God and tells God how afraid he is or how angry he is. Um, how unfair his circumstances are, all of the things that he wishes God would do to his enemies. One of my favorite um, passages is where David talks about how much he wishes he were a bird and could just fly away from this whole mess that is his life right now. Like, I can identify with that kind of overwhelm. I just want to get out and leave it all behind. But you'll notice this beautiful pattern where as David pours all of his negative emotion and worry and problems out to God, when he gives himself that space to lament, he then has space to receive who God is and God's love for him and God's peace and God's presence in his life. And it turns men into gratitude and worship. But that process there is essential. We cannot skip it. We very much want to get to the good part where it's all gratitude and peace and I'm calm and I feel safe and I can worship God freely. Um, the problem is we have all of these emotions and struggles and anxieties um, and what Schizero describes as the false self that are taking so much inner space, we don't have room for that kind of revelation for God unless it's cleared out of the way first. It's clouding our vision. It's hampering our ability to hear from God. It's distracting us at best and harming us at worst. So, this is a process, and when that happens, when we're practicing silent meditation, it's not a bad thing. We're actually exactly on track. It's really good for that to be cleared out on a regular basis. Um, so, Peter Schizero, um, he writes, I was taught not to do feelings as a Christian, 
especially anger, sadness, and fear. The focus of my spiritual life was also upward and outward, to grow our church, reach people for Christ, release others into ministry, learn how to be a better leader, and so on. But I did not realize that a relationship with Christ required listening to my feelings before God. I rarely looked at the inner chaos that was my thoughts and feelings. The very thought of going down that road of introspection or self-reflection was frightening. I feared a dam to my interior life might break open and drown me in the ministry I had built. What good would it be to look at my worst thoughts, envious desires, and inner rages? I sincerely believed it was more godly to suppress them and set my mind on things above. That's from Colossians 3.2. But biblical spirituality, by contrast, required coming to terms with our struggles and shadows, those untamed emotions, the less-than-pure motives, and thoughts that shape our behaviors. I came to understand that a necessary condition for growing into a mature disciple is having the courage to meet the unvarnished truth about ourselves head on instead of running from it. He also points out that we see this actually all the way through scripture. We just forget that it applies to us too, as though we're somehow the exception to the rule of humanity. Um, he talks about Job's ranting before God, Jeremiah's depression, Moses' anguish in the wilderness, David's raw emotions in the Psalms. All of these expressed their emotions with unashamed freedom. It's okay. And that expression of their emotions before God um, gave them the intimacy with him that they needed to be ministered to in those places. So all of this is not meant to be a discouragement. I just don't want you to be blindsided by it. And I also don't want you to think that every time you practice silence, you have to like brace yourself for it to be really hard. God is so much gentler with us than that. Um, just be aware if things are coming to the surface, God is speaking to you and actively loving you. Even when that process is painful and we're dealing with difficult emotions, when we grieve over things like where we located our identity and our worth, um, the Holy Spirit is working on setting us free from these things. He's not trying to make us dwell on them and be stuck in them. God's will for us is never that we be stuck, but that we grow into maturity. So then every time we choose to trust God and obey him, he will give us more of himself. And that's what we're after with this practice of silence, is to have not only a deeper communion with God, to be in his presence, but actually to know him better. And so for that, we need to also let the Holy Spirit make space in us. Um, and this is not the pat answer of you just need Jesus kind of way. Um, there really are not words, which is why we're going to practice a lot together today. There are not words to describe the depth of love and peace that we get to experience when we do this. God is completely unmatched in this area. There is nothing that I can achieve talking to you about it that God cannot outdo um, by you just practicing this for a little while. The most frequently given command in scripture is do not be afraid. It is shocking how much of our overfunctioning, our busyness, and our doing over being with God, our unhealthy coping mechanisms, our giving into temptation comes from a place of fear. In 1 John 4, we are told that such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. So what we need here is a deeper revelation a deeper experience of God's love. We're going to have to take some time to let it seep into our soul. Um, we often think that the answer to our struggles, like Martha, is a practical kind of doing, that my circumstances need to change, that I just need someone to help me handle all of this work, um, that I just need to work harder or work smarter or work more efficiently. 
if I can just get this done, or if I can just get past this season, then I'll be okay. The problem is, that is not the issue. Um, it is far more likely that our struggle is actually a deficit of love. That what we need is to be filled to overflowing by God's love. So those fears don't have a hold on us. And we are free to live and work and relate to others in healthy ways. No matter how busy of a season we happen to be in. Because we do have genuinely busy seasons. But we need that filling of love first. Otherwise, our self is going to get in the way. And we're going to instinctively try to manage and compensate and control to deal with our anxieties. So we need this practice of silence before God to be filled up by his love, to let go of our working and over-functioning as a coping mechanism to try to handle our own anxieties. And so a lot of this practice is just learning how to surrender to God every day. Now there's tons more that Schizero goes into in his book, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, which I highly recommend. I am talking about a very tiny portion of the book. Um, but we're going to leave the rest of that material for other sessions. Um, do you have any questions or comments so far? What are your thoughts on this? I'll just give a brief testimony. Two years ago, you, you talked for my first time about silence and solitude. Mm -hmm. That's good. No, that's excellent. Yeah. So Schizero goes on to write that if we are going to do for God, out of our being with God, we need to practice things like silence and stillness in order to nurture our relationship with him. In fact, without the practice of intentional silence before the Lord, it is almost impossible to mature into spiritual adulthood with a doing for God that is sustained by a being with God. Why? Because we are so full of distractions and worries and plans that our inner world is jam-packed, allowing limited room for God to fill us. Um, integrating silence and stillness utterly transforms the way we follow Jesus and the way we lead. So he argues here, and I'm going to talk more specifically about silence in a minute, um, but he argues here that because we are so used to um, prioritizing what we do, that becomes where we identify, where our identity and our self-worth is located. That alone is going to bring up a lot of anxiety for us. And this is where even just going through changing seasons, where if you are switching from working to staying at home, or switching from full-time parenting or homeschooling <laughs> to having a season um, where that's not so prevalent, things like that. Um, big changes in our seasons can be very unnerving because, and this happens to almost everyone on the planet, at some time or other, we tend to identify with what we do. And so at least on a regular basis, we are gonna have to reorient ourselves to make sure that our identity is located in Christ and who we are in him, and that sets us free then to do all of those things without being ruled by them. So, in this practice of silence, which is kind of a touchstone practice um, for Schizero, uh, he talks about in silence we let go, surrendering our will to God's will. At the core of God's words to us is the invitation to surrender control of our lives, to practice letting go moment by moment of the illusion that we are the center of the universe. In prayer, we surrender our desire for control, approval, and security. 
Once I began to practice silence, I realized most of my petitions to God were coming from a place of fear and loss of control. I had so many things I wanted God to do for me that the joy of communion with him was often lost. Um, this is one of the reasons that a lot of people argue that intercessory prayer shouldn't happen on our Sabbath because it is more of a work kind of prayer. It's not a bad work at all. Um, we should never discourage intercessory prayer. It's wonderful. However, um, we need to make sure that we have this right orientation to Jesus first rather than to trying to accomplish things in prayer. And we could end up accidentally turning prayer into our own work. Um, we want to make sure that when we are interceding, that we are asking for whatever we need in his name and not out of our own fear and control and what might be a threatened sense of self. That ultimately, it's not out of our own self-will, but surrender to the will of the Father. Scazzaro goes on to say, in practicing silence, we let go of our willfulness and clutching. Our approach to prayer changes from focusing on getting God to do what we want to positioning ourselves so that we want what God wants. Fewer things in life are more difficult than accepting what God wants us to do. But in silence, we practice letting go of our agendas, allowing communion with God to become the core of our lives. We come to God in prayer not to get something from him, such as a word of encouragement or guidance, but simply to be with him. Being silent in God's presence is prayer. Silence slows us down enough to receive God's love without distractions. We realize our very existence as human beings is an expression of God's generosity and love flowing to us. Now we have space to receive that love and allow it to saturate every aspect of our being one level at a time. In silence, we let go, allowing God to deeply transform us. The Holy Spirit works through the layers of our lives, sorting out what is not us from what is us, removing what was never meant to be a part of who we are so we can be our full, lovingly created selves and learn to fully live out our identity as new creations in Christ. In silence, we let go, opening ourselves to hear God speak. Imagine having a relationship with a person and all they do is speak. It's all about their words and their requests. This is a one-way relationship. However, when we integrate intentional silence into our prayer life, we enter into a two-way relationship, one that allows us to abide with God, be held by God, and listen to God. If we stay with silence, be it for two minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes, or more each day, it revolutionizes our relationship with God. And while listening for a message is not the primary goal of spending time with God in silence, um, I often find God nudging me toward better choices, inviting me to let go of anxiety, or speaking to me about a blind spot in a particular area of my life. I never cease to be amazed at how much God wants to say when I turn away from the external and internal noise around me. So is there any of that that stands out to you? Do you have any questions 
um, right now about what we've talked about before we take a quick break. Okay, we're gonna break for 10 minutes um, before we go into the actual practice side of this. Um, but if we have questions after that, because sometimes we need a minute to think, um, then we'll start with questions, all right? So we'll come back at, yeah, we'll come back at 11, and then we'll do the actual practice side of this, okay?
Do you want to continue? We're good? Okay. Um, do you have any questions before we get into the practice side? Okay. So, as I said, this half we had to focus on practice. Um, with all spiritual practices, it is going to take time and um, various attempts and experimentation in order to figure out what your particular personality and your mental and spiritual state means. That can change even from season to season. So um, practice is our key word here in order to get in deep with this practice of silence. Um, the first thing to remember is we need to start where we are, not where we think we should be. If we pressure ourselves, um, it's very, very easy to undermine ourselves. We want to grow in this discipline in a life-giving way. We don't want to overburden ourselves. The second thing to remember is always to be gentle with yourself. Often when we're starting something new or if we're moving, in, moving into a new phase of a practice, we tend to get worse before we get better. That's not wrong. It's just reality and how we're wired. There is no condemnation in Christ, and so you keep practicing. Um, we always ask God to help us and give us wisdom because no one knows us better than God. Um, and we will have lots of supports that we can experiment with as we go. So you have this silent meditation guide. Um, ignore the first section, because this was originally developed to be like a self-guided approach last summer. Um, we're going to ignore the top and start where it says spiritual practices. A lot of this content comes from a book by Ken Shigematsu, Survival Guide of the Soul. And he has an excellent section in there on silence, too. Um, but he talks about how we are lured into believing that we can take control of our lives. We foolishly believe the lie that we can become like God through independence from him. As we turn away from our creator, we experience distorted desires for pleasure, power, and privilege. 
which in turn breeds shame, fear, and alienation from God, our true selves, and one another. Jesus' work on the cross reconciles us with God and restores our good, true, and beautiful desires so that we might share the mind and heart of Christ. This means that the most powerful way to cultivate a healthy, soulful Adam, the part of us that is created for relationship, for spiritual connection, and for meaning in life, enlivened by God's spirit, is not by commanding ourselves like a drill sergeant to live the right way, but through a living relationship with Jesus, the true lover of our soul. The transformative love of Jesus Christ tunes the desires of our soul. We easily forget that we are deeply loved by our maker. A rhythm of spiritual practices helps us remember to whom we belong and by whom we are loved. Like anything worthwhile, spiritual training is moving us toward a goal that is in harmony with the way we're made to live. This means that we need to embrace the spiritual practices that are consistent with the grain of our character. Ideally, these practices will meet our deepest joy and our deepest need. With God's help, we embrace spiritual practices that shape the way we move through the world. So then, with this practice of silent meditation, it's different, as we've already discussed, um, from how we commonly understand prayer. Prayer is often understood as speaking to God, and meditation involves quietly savoring God's presence. In meditation and silent prayer, our posture is receptive rather than expressive, and attentive rather than spoken. The goal here is to listen, rest, and enjoy God's presence as a form of worship. And then he provided um, several examples of this in scripture. In the 23rd Psalm, God calls us literally and figuratively to lie down in green pastures and rest beside quiet waters in order to restore our souls. As the presence of the great shepherd frees our hearts from anxiety and pain, we are less likely to turn to an addiction for comfort because our hearts find rest in God. Silent prayer leads to a powerful change in the way we inhabit the world because it grows our capacity to pay attention to our creator even when we are not consciously praying. This is one of the reasons that for Schizero, the practice of silence is so key because if you can start your day, especially with this, then it is gonna have a huge influence on how you move through the rest of your day. It helps us stay in tune with the presence of God. So to practice, simply take time each morning to sit quietly in God's presence. Start with five minutes with the option to linger longer. And after a few weeks, most find 10 to 20 minutes ideal. Meditating throughout the day, five to 10 minutes at a time, can also be re-energizing, centering, clarifying, and calming for our busy minds. Um, two of the best supports are to inhale and exhale deeply through your nose to help relax your body and still your mind. And then silently repeating a phrase or a single word from scripture, such as be still or wait, also helps focus our distracted thoughts on God and primes us to notice his loving presence throughout the day. Try connecting this to your breath so that on the inhale, you would say as an example, peace, and on the exhale, you remind yourself to be still. If you flip over to the next page, says this is not a magical incantation it is not a method of invoking God's presence or a way to control God God is always with us and he is entirely sovereign this practice does however help us become more aware of the God who is already with us neither is this the vain repetition that we are warned of in Matthew 6 verse 7 there is nothing vain about gently calling ourselves to be still before God nor anything hollow about focusing on a word such as love to remind us of the love of the Father or centering on the name Jesus or God. What it does is it just helps our body and our mind become still. The reason they recommend five minutes is because it's probably going to take you at least two or three to settle down and get still, at least. And that gives us two minutes where we're actually being still. Um, so we're going to try this for a few minutes. I'm going to walk you through 
Um, and we're going to try it with the breath prayer. And then I'm going to talk about other supports and things that we can use. So, um, do I need to get to the right page? Yes, that's probably a good idea. Thank you. So what are the main reasons they recommend doing this in the morning, as close to first thing in the morning as possible? It's because we are creatures of habit. We naturally tend towards rhythms of thinking and doing. Once you get going in your day, it's really hard to stop. <laughs> However, if you've just woken up, if you've only had your cup of coffee, right, the less you have done, the less you're into that rhythm of doing things apart from God. It's much easier to just focus your mind. So if this is a little more challenging to focus our minds right now because we're already into our day, don't worry about that. Um, there's ways we can handle that too. Um, but just know there is a genuinely, and I'm not a morning person, so this is a huge thing for me to admit, it is generally best and easiest to do this first thing in the morning. So what I'm going to have you do is just close your eyes, and we're going to start taking deep breaths. And as you breathe in, you can count to five. And as you breathe out, you're going to count to five. And as you continue that same rhythm of breathing, as you inhale, you're just going to remind yourself peace. And as you exhale, you're going to remind yourself, be still. Slowly, you're just going to let yourself become aware of God's presence, remembering that he is always with you. He is closer to us than our breath. And any time that you find your thoughts getting distracted, you just come back to inhaling peace and breathing out.
and that was about three minutes total. Um, we're gonna pause, and we're gonna we are gonna do this again a few different times and lengths of time. Um, but just as our first try, uh, what did you think? Did it feel like a really long time? Did that feel like a good amount of time? Do you need more time? Um, did you notice any physical tension or physical distractions? I know it's really hot and that, that is not helpful, but <laughs> did you notice anything else? One of the reasons using the breath is helpful um, is because we are physical and spiritual beings. Um, we have to get our body to be still, but actually getting our body engaged in this well helps still our mind as well. When you breathe in the same amount of time that you breathe out, which is why we count to five or whatever works for you, when those breaths in and out match, it says a signal to our nervous system that we're actually in a place of safety. And that helps calm us down, and that helps kind of short circuit some of the anxiety that our minds are inclined to move toward. Um, another thing, and we're set up for this well because we're all sitting in the pews, um, but another thing to remember is that laying down doesn't tend to make this better. Laying down tells our body, let's go to sleep, <laughs> and it actually starts a different process. Now, some people can do this very well laying down, that's excellent. Um, but most people, it's going to tell us to go to sleep, and our mind will actually follow different thought patterns. Sitting up um, in a comfortable place is usually the best. For some people, myself included, the best thing to do is actually to sit on the floor because it is physically grounding, and that can help us be still. Um, and also tells our body that, hey, this is a little bit different than how I normally function. And so sitting on the floor, if you're comfortable doing that, can also be helpful. Did you notice any bus busyness or mental distraction coming up? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Me too. So um, we're going to try this again. I'm going to walk you this time through relaxing your body very particularly. Um, and then I'm going to give you a couple of other breath prayers that we're going to do throughout this process. And we're going to give it more time this try. Okay. At any point, you can ignore what I'm saying and just let yourself sink into stillness and be with God. Okay, I'm just here as an assistant, but if God is making you still, because ultimately the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to a place of stillness, then just follow his leading. So we're going to start with closing our eyes again. Make sure that you are sitting first in a position that's fairly comfortable for you. And you're going to start taking those deep breaths again. Inhale for five and exhale for a count of five. Now, as you breathe, we're going to focus on letting our body relax and become still. Even though we're sitting still, we can still have parts of our body that are activated intention. And so we're going to start with our feet and our ankles, and we're going to let them just lock onto the floor. There is nowhere we have to be right now. And then on your next exhale, you're going to release any tension in your legs. And then you're going to release any tension in your torso and let yourself really settle into where you're sitting. And then you're going to release any tension in your shoulders, in your arms, in your hands. And then you're going to release tension in your neck, in your face, especially your jaw.
as you continue to breathe, on the inhale, we're going to pray, Holy Spirit. And on the exhale, we're going to pray, help me be still. Or you can pray, Holy Spirit, still me. other thoughts come up, we're just going to acknowledge them and set them aside. If anything has an anxious sense to it, give it to God. You can talk to him about it. You can even picture handing it physically to the Father. And then bring your mind back to God. you relax into that stillness you can start to meditate on a name or an attribute of God that's particularly important to you and let that become your focus whenever you are breathing in and whenever you're breathing out We're going to come back to our group. 
Yeah, what did you think of that practice? in particular that you found helpful in this time? Okay, so we're gonna go back to our guide for a bit. Um, Cause there's more support down here. Um, so on the second page, the section that starts with depending on how God has created you, a simple physical movement or focus activity can also help still your mind. This can be things like taking, a, taking an easy drive, walking, knitting, making bread, anything that helps you find that sweet spot of focus without taking your attention away from God or preventing you from being present. This can be a good addition to your practice. Um, because some people are actually <laughs> literally designed this way where they need movement to help their mind be still. Um, or, it says, your temperament may need physical stillness in God's presence. So we already talked about how the physical posture of sitting and deliberately refraining from all activity helps us embody our desire to be still, and it serves as a reminder that God holds the world. I am free to stop and let go. That I am actively choosing to wait in faith for the God who loves me to act in his time according to his good and perfect will. That's that surrender aspect that Schizero was talking about. <coughs> um, a little further down, it says, As we sit quietly in God's presence and relax, garbage may rise to the surface on the sea of our lives. Anxiety, fear, disappointment, resentment, envy, pain, shame, or anger. When we offer this garbage up to God, we experience purging and cleansing, new freedom. And clearing out this garbage and noise helps us to be more focused throughout the day while also gradually healing our desires. As our soul's needs are met, we are less likely to seek out alternative coping mechanisms or what um, Ken Shigematsu talks about as um, addictions. And other times, we may receive the gift of being quietly surrounded by the holy, loving, mysterious presence that upholds us and the world. Most people do not experience anything particularly dramatic during meditation or during this practice of silence. It is rather ordinary most of the time. The best way to begin the day is to be still and remember that God is God and I am not. So when it comes to using a breath prayer like we did uh, to help us become still, if there's a particular name of God or a particular verse um, or just a phrase from scripture that helps remind you of that, helps you remind you of God's love, his goodness, his care for you, that's a really good thing to meditate, to meditate on. Because what we are doing is taking that time, first thing, or the first opportunity we get in the day um, to remind our soul of who God is and that we are safe because of him. And that helps orient us to Jesus rather than moving into a place of self-reliance. Um, yeah, let's keep reading on the sheet. Um, the goal of meditation is not to experience bliss in a single moment. Rather, it is to rest in our Father's company and to consent to the work of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our lives. As we wait on God, we may feel distracted and even bored, but over time, we will become more aware that God is with us, especially during the parts of the day when we are not consciously praying. The goal of silent meditation is not to become a successful meditator, but to open our soul, mind, and body to the quiet work of the Holy Spirit so that we become more attentive to God's movements within and around us. If we incorporate meditation into the rhythm of our lives, it will transform our way of being in the world. Um, 
So a couple other things that will help with stillness and silence. The best one for me is actually to use worship. So um, this is not something I do for like my daily silence, silence practice, but it, especially if I've had a rough week or month and I have gone back to um, habits of overfunctioning and busyness and that sort of thing, um, being able to be in one of the extended worship services is really helpful. One, because I'm not in charge of anything. Two, because worship, when we're, and I'm talking about singing kind of worship, that includes our whole body, includes our mind, includes our voice. Um, you can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, whatever you need to do. Um, but it focuses my whole person on God. And then we also have the lyrics of the songs, which help us meditate on him. And I've had a few times where um, five, six songs in is when that stillness really settles into me. Um, and other times where I actually needed to not join in singing, I needed to just sit and be still for a couple of minutes during the first few songs, and the Holy Spirit kind of drops me into this place of stillness, and from there, I can focus entirely on God. It's fantastic, and it's absolutely a work of God. Um, but worship can be very, very helpful if our minds are very loud and busy. Um, sometimes we need the music just cranked up to drown out the voices. Um, another thing that helps, and we've started this a little bit with the breath prayer, is praying scripture. Um, if, you've, um, if you've heard of the prayer Bible workshops that Krista has done, which I'm not sure we have videos of yet, um, but one of the things she recommends we do is you go through scripture, and there's lots of verses online, or lots of lists online for this, and you can mark all of the verses that talk about um, attributes of God, for example. And you go through and you read slowly, verse by verse, each one and what it says about God. And that lets God start speaking to us. And reading it out loud can be very helpful to make us be still, because again, we're including our body in this and not just our mind. And that it almost makes this feedback loop in us or if my body is helping my mind be still, then my mind will be more still and my body will be more still. And it just, it all fits together. Um, another recommendation is to set an alarm when you practice this, especially if you're doing it in the morning um, and you have somewhere to be. That'll keep you from checking the time anxiously in case we've taken too long. Um, that'll help reduce that anxiety a lot. Um, the other thing, and Louise, you mentioned this earlier, um, is our environment is very helpful. So for some people, it's not about necessarily posture or um, having something to do with our hands. It's about being in nature. Um, and so being outside when the weather is nice can be very helpful. Uh, for some people, it's being able to listen to rain. Um, for Krista, I know it's sitting in the sun just helps her be still for some reason. Um, whatever helps you move into that place of stillness, you want to take full advantage as often as possible because there is a reason that we are wired the way we are. It's good to have different options because if we're always relying on it being sunny out here, it's not going to work very well for a regular practice of stillness. Um, but like I said, we keep experimenting and finding things that work. Do you have any questions or comments about that so far? I don't really like breathing in and outside. It doesn't keep feeling like I'm in a hyper rush. Okay, so you can change the number. <laughs> Cause, I'm, I'm yeah. So often, um, it's just to get us started, <laughs> and then for some people, it helps to maintain that. Um, for me, my, actually, my breathing actually stops being deep when I'm still, and actually my breathing itself lessens a lot, and I breathe quite shallowly. Um, so go with what helps you. <laughs> if it starts to become a distraction, you can just set that aside. That's not helpful right now. We don't need that. Um, yeah, so like I said, if you can start with a few breaths, 
that are just even in terms of time. I pick five because that's kind of an average amount of time for people. Some people taking a breath in for a count of five, that's way too much. Um, and that's going to make them feel anxious. We don't want that. For some people, they need like a really long count because they have really good lung capacity or they want to breathe very slowly. So please feel free to edit that to what you what is going to work for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, yeah, and sometimes it's not even so much. I'm trying to think because I don't necessarily count every time when I do it. I usually go right to whatever I'm praying and meditating on. Um, but deep breathing helps um, until I'm not thinking about my breathing anymore. Part of it is just to have something to focus our mind on first. I do find that um, when my body is tense in particular and I'm having a hard time because I'm very fidgety, <laughs> physically being still, making sure that I release tension on an exhale, that sort of thing, that can help get my body centered, but I don't do that for the whole 10 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever it is that day um, because I have other things to think about. <laughs> I, usually that's only for the first couple of minutes that I'm focusing on that and then praying the scripture and then ideally from there I've moved into a place of stillness with God, um, but it varies day to day. Yeah. So use these things only as much as they help you and if they're not helping, <laughs> switch to something else. You are always allowed to tailor this to how you are wired and what's going to work for you. Um, there's one more thing. I don't think we're going to try it. I'll just talk to us about it. Um, if you find that you're having one of, those, one of those days where a lot of that garbage is coming up to the surface, um, there's this prayer practice uh, that comes from the Quakers, if I remember correctly, called Palms Down. Um, and this one is very good if your mind is busy and you have a lot of things coming up that are anxiety or sometimes the Holy Spirit will take us through seasons of running us through a whole bunch of undealt with memories and things like that. Um, so you start with your palms down because again, we need a physical component and you focus on releasing to God all of the things that the Holy Spirit is bringing up. So you can switch gears partway through your your stillness practice, your silence practice. If you find that, my goodness, there is so much coming up, I need to physically release that to God. And you can talk to him about it. You can tell God that, God, I don't want to feel this. Or when that happens, that actually really hurt me. And I'm, I still feel pain from that. And I ask for you to heal me from it and hand all of those things one by one over to God. And when you run out of things, or when you find yourself coming into that place of stillness, when it's less noisy in your mind, then you switch to palms up. And you can specifically ask God for what you need if there's things that have come to mind, whether that's healing or a deeper filling of his love um, or freedom from certain things. Often, um, I will just say, God, you know what I need. I don't want to be in charge at that point. God, you know what I need. Will you please just give me whatever I need today? Or will you please just meet those deep needs because I can't even sometimes identify what they are. And that's how you spend the rest of your time is just with palms up, asking God to give you whatever he has for you. And sometimes um, this leads into more of the, the listening prayer where God will speak to you. Um, sometimes we have experiences with God as, as Ken mentioned and as Pete Scazzaro mentioned, where we do have this deep revelation of God's love for us, this sense of being held, of being loved, of being cared for and protected, and we feel very at peace and grounded in his love. Sometimes we'll get that very specifically. Sometimes it is the most normal average day you've ever had. There's nothing remarkable about it, but it is good when those things are coming up in our mind that we actually take the opportunity to give them over to God. So like I said, the palms down, palms up practice is really helpful when those things are coming up. We don't necessarily have to worry about why they're coming up now. It's often just that the Holy Spirit went, mm, today is the day, right? Now you are in the right place to deal with this. And we can trust that if God is drawing our attention to something, that there is grace then 
to deal with it and to become free from it, to be healed from it. And that may be a process. You may find you're giving the same things over to God um, for a season, but keep at it because a lot of these things are very deeply rooted in us and it can take multiple times to, to work through those layers with the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, there's other supports and practices depending on what those things are that we're working through with God, but that's how it would come up in our time of silence. One other thing that I find particularly helpful, and I think this is similar to um, how worship is helpful for me, is having um, actual audio guided prayer. When it's something that's written or something that I am choosing, and this might be just how my brain works, but it puts me too much in charge and I'm still in this kind of doing mode. And so I like to come away from reading and definitely being on my phone. Um, but on YouTube, if you look up Practicing the Way um, Prayer Companion Guide, they actually have four prayer practice by um, Stehan Coleman, uh, who's Australian and a fantastic um, writer on um, contemplative prayer. But he has um, these four different prayers that he did for the study um, where he walks you through. One is the Lord's Prayer. That one's one of my favorites. He walks you through the Lord's Prayer line by line, um, helps you get grounded, gives you some things to meditate on for each line, and gives you a space in between each to pray or to listen to God. And that helps me be still because I don't have to be in control. I don't have to think and try to remember, where am I in the Lord's Prayer? What's the next? Pr I don't have to. He's going to tell me in a minute. It's totally fine. And it lets me just let go a little bit more. So again, those are on YouTube. Um, if you look at practicing the way in prayer, they'll come up. Um, and they're fantastic. Or I'm sure there's lots of other audio guided prayers. Um, but those things, anything that helps us surrender more to God is, is going to be a good way to deepen our practice. Do you have any questions or thoughts? Is there a difference between silence and listening to God? Um, yes and no. Um, silence, we want to make sure. Silence, I'm very deliberately not I think with silence, I'm more deliberately not saying things to God. With listening prayer, um, I think that often comes after this practice of silence. Silence is like my side of it, if that makes sense. Very often, it is in those silent places where God will speak to us. Um, not only in those, but often in those. Um, listening prayer can also be part of when we're meditating on scripture. So I think maybe listening prayer is a broader category a little bit. But there's definitely a big overlap. Um, and some traditions are going to refer to it as contemplative prayer, and that'll include aspects of all of these. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's get out of this very hot room. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, and if you have questions later, let me know. The video will be up on YouTube in a few days if you want to refer back to it. Thank you.